Hello, Kara Palmieri here. You can call me Professor Palmieri. You can call me Professor P. Some people call me Palmieri. I don't care what you call me. I don't have any ego issues. So whatever, if you call me Kara, I'm not going to get mad. Um, I want to introduce myself and my patient Susie here. Um, we're going to work with her and several other human patient simulators in the nursing program. I will be working with you during your first seven weeks of clinical front loading um, that will take place on campus. Um, and all of that information will be posted so you'll know. And I, I always make sure you know what to expect next week before we leave this week. Um, so there should be no um, confusion or anything um, associated with clinical front loading. Um, I have been a nurse for 30 years. It's hard to believe I graduated from this program in 1994. Some of you weren't alive yet and I could be your mamas. Um, we won't talk about that. Um, I've been teaching for 18 here at ICC. I'll retire from here but as long as they'll have me. I'm going to be here. Um, I love what I do. Um, even though I don't take care of the patients myself physically anymore, I get the same reward by seeing you grow and develop into great nurses. So that's what my objective is every day. Um, and it's very gratifying. I get a lot of joy out of that. All right, um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start. Um, today's focus will be on your general assessment of the patient and also your skin, hair, nails and your head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. Now we're doing this real simple. We're not gonna do this real complex because this is a bedside assessment that I'm teaching you to do. Um, so it's not gonna be a full assessment like you maybe heard of before that nurses have to learn. This is a very quick bedside assessment. Um, this is only one piece of it today. Um, I will eventually get one for you that's a full bedside assessment and you'll be amazed how quick I can do a really good assessment on a patient. So I'm gonna teach you all of my techniques that I've acquired over the years. Um, but the first thing that you always want to do is let the patient see you clean your hands. This is important because it builds trust. Um, this is somebody that you've never met before. They don't know you. They are probably scared and worried. Um, and so having you have compassion and patience with them and seeing you clean your hands is going to build trust in a relationship that doesn't even exist yet. Um, so getting off on the right foot with um, trust and um, your relationship with the patient. All right. Um, the first thing that you're going to do when you walk in, you're going to greet the patient and clean your hands in front of them, and they're going to get used to seeing that. Don't be alarmed if somebody may ask you if you've cleaned your hands. If they ask you, clean them again in front of them. It doesn't matter if you washed your hands at the sink before they came in, before you came in the room. It makes them feel good to see you do it. So do it in front of them. Um, I'm going to start by looking at her. She doesn't show any signs of distress, okay? She's um, blinking, she's sitting upright, she looks well, even though she's in the hospital for something. I'm gonna start by looking at her IV site over here. Um, I'm also gonna look at her ID band and make sure that what she tells me her ID is and what is on her bracelet matches. If she has any fall risk or allergy bracelets, I'll check to see if those are in place. And then I'm gonna look at her IV site just to make sure that it looks okay. So by okay, I mean no redness. So I'm gonna look not only at the insertion site where the IV goes in, but also around the skin and up her arm. I don't see anything that looks like inflammatory changes happening. So I'm satisfied with that. I'm also gonna look for any kind of swelling. We call it infiltration. If your IV stops flowing into the vein and that fluid will start to leak around in the tissues in underneath the skin, um, and that's called infiltration and it'll be cold and swollen and the patient will notice it um, if they're able to notice those things. Um, if they're alert and oriented, they'll probably put their light on and say, my IV isn't, something's not right. And it, a lot of times it will hurt too because of the swelling, it's stretching the skin. Sometimes it itches or stings. Um, so those are just things to be aware of. It's important to watch your IV sites 
because some medications can cause terrible breakdown to the tissues below the skin surface. Um, and so you always want to keep an eye on your IV site to make sure that your IV fluid is going into the vein. It's not IV if it's not going into the vein. So it's really important to check that to protect your patient from any harm while you're taking care of them. She also has her call light here, um, which isn't that big of a deal right now because I'm with her, but when I walk out of the room, I need to make sure that this is within her reach so she can reach me if she needs anything at all. Okay, so with that, I think I will start with my assessment talk. I'm gonna share my screen with you so that you can see what I'm gonna lecture on you about. Okay, you should see RNRS 117 skin and H-E-E-N-T assessment, Cara Palmieri RNMSN. So I'm just gonna advance ahead. Some general information regarding assessment. Assessment has subjective and objective data. You may or may not have had health history already with this assessment um, learning that you're doing. Um, your health history is considered subjective data. And so that's a more formal subjective data where you're asking the patient specific questions and seeking information from them. But subjective data can also include things that the patient tells you incidentally. Um, it could be anything. It could be, I don't feel well today. I feel better today. I'm hungry. Um, I can't wait to get out of here. I slept terrible last night. Um, I'm glad to see you back again today. Sometimes they'll be glad to see you if they see you more than one day in a row. Um, so those are all subjective data, anything the patient tells you. And then you're gonna proceed to the physical assessment and that's what you see when you examine the patient. That can include anything that would be used with your stethoscope, anything I see with my eyes. It can be my vital signs up here, um, any data that's concrete that you can see. All right, um, with health assessment, there are four techniques. We are gonna learn three of them. The first one is inspection, and it's just what it sounds like. You're looking at the patient. Um, it can involve listening also. So if you're just listening to them talk, not stethoscope listening, that's auscultation, but just her, listening to her talk and looking at her face while she's telling me things, that all goes with inspection. So think noticing and observing. Some of the, your inspection will be deliberate and some will be incidental, okay? So if my patient's just telling me about their night or telling me about the circumstances leading up to their admission, um, that is just incidental um, observation. I'm watching them. <clears throat> I'm gonna notice if they seem upset about anything or if they're relieved about anything, you'll notice the emotions tied to what they're telling you. The second technique is palpation, and that involves physical contact with your hands. That may be the fingertips using for palpating pulses. It could be the backs of the hands for palpating temperature. Um, it could be the palmar surface of my hand um, to see if there's any type of tenderness or how what the consistency of the abdomen feels like. So anything that involves hands on your patient. And then auscultation. Um, is listening with your stethoscope. When we do our first unit, our first body system where we have to use a stethoscope, I'm gonna orient you to your stethoscope. Um, so that not in this presentation, but in one coming up um, so that you can use your stethoscope the very best way, um, the best that you can, because that is gonna give you the best assessment and be better for the patient for better outcomes. Um, your assessment is everything um, when you're a nurse. Um, you're the person next to the patient 24-7, so it, your assessment is so very important, and that's where we're going to figure out if the patient's getting better or worse. You're going to be that first line. And then the last technique that we're not going to teach is percussion, and it is a, a more advanced technique, and that involves using your hand on the patient and then striking your knuckle, and you're listening for a certain sound. We used to teach that and we found that it was 
not really used very much by bedside nurses for one thing, um, but it is more of an advanced technique. So you will see doctors and uh, more um, advanced nurses using it, um, but we're not going to teach that, at least not this semester. You may learn some of those techniques as you advance into more complex, com complex concepts as you move through the nursing program. So beginning with the skin, um, the assessment techniques here are gonna be inspection and palpation. You're gonna start by asking the patient pertinent health history. Now this might not have anything to do with why the patient's here. If it's your health history assignment, you have to ask all of those questions. But if let's say your patient is here to give birth, okay? I don't care about her past history of acne as a child or her past history of eczema as a child. I care, but I don't care. It's not really pertinent to what's happening right now. So you, you will learn to decide what goes with what you're dealing with right in front of you and ask questions that have to do with that. Some examples of things that you might ask about is if there's a history of any liver or kidney failure, um, those things can have skin implications. Um, for example, patients with renal failure can have um, crystals on their skin and be really dry and dry looking and itchy, but it's the crystals that can develop on their skin. Um, that's not real, real common, but it's something that you might see. Um, liver failure, you would know that because you would see jaundice in the patient in their skin and also in the sclera of their eyes. Um, autoimmune diseases, particularly um, psoriasis um, can cause plaques, um, even eczema or um, allergic um, seasonal type things like eczema in the winter time, um, things like that. Um, any previous history of skin problems. So maybe they dealt a lot with hives or ir urticaria for um, some time of their life. So they may share that with you. Um, if they have allergies, maybe they're allergic to strawberries and it makes them break out in hives. Maybe they're allergic to penicillin and it makes them break out in hives. Those are very important things to know. Skin eruptions as an allergy are true allergies and should always be taken seriously. Um, especially sometimes you'll see like um, swelling around the lip. That's a real common one that you'll see with ACE inhibitors or a drug called lisinopril. Um, sometimes patients can have a swollen lip or their tongue can get swollen. And that becomes a, a concern because if anything in the oral airway is beginning to swell, you worry about that going on down the throat. All right. Um, I would also want to know what type of work the patient does. Are they, do they work in a factory where there's a lot of emissions or do they work in healthcare? Are they a nurse or are they a doctor or a surgeon? Um, any other types of occupational things? Oh, maybe they work, maybe they're a contractor and they work with saws and so they maybe end up cutting themselves. Um, so it's always good to know if you have time, maybe that's not the most top priority, but at some point it's good to know your patient because then you know the whole patient. Um, and I usually find those things out by just having, just talking to the patient. Um, that'll be hard for you at first because you're gonna be very focused on what you have to do. But as you get down the process of what you have to do, the small talk will come easily and then you'll gain so much more information from your interactions with the patient. Some common symptoms that the patient might report that have to do with skin. Um, some of these are pretty obvious. Rashes, itching, um, skin pain. And so think shingles with that. I don't know if any of you are familiar with shingles. That is the same virus that causes chicken pox. And probably none of you had chicken pox because you were all vaccinated against it. Um, but my generation, we still had chicken pox. I had it when I was two. Um, so that virus is in our bodies and can come active again at any point. Um, shingles is actually pretty easy to pick up on. If you see it once, you'll recognize it easily anytime you see it in the future. It hurts and it usually forms in a line along one of the dermatomes and you will see it on one side of the body. It doesn't cross the midline. So you'll see it a real common place is to see it on the flank here on the rib cage. 
Um, but if you look up a, a picture from your biology class of the dermatomes and see how all those lines go across that human body, that's where the shingles will erupt is in one of those lines and it'll be on one side. All right, but it does hurt. And that's one of the first things the patient will say is it hurts right here and then the blisters erupt. All right, some changes in color, texture or hair distribution. Um, this is particularly true for men if they have um, hairy legs, but they've noticed that maybe this leg isn't growing hair anymore. It may have just worn off. It may be that gentleman's normal, uh, but if there was previously hair there and now there isn't, I wonder about the blood supply to that area and have those follicles died off. That is something that could happen if there's circulatory problems with the patient. Um, so definitely looking at things like that. Um, fingernail changes that would go in with skin also. Um, bruising, scratches, abrasions, welts, and burns. And that's not an all-inclusive list. That list goes on. Scars and keloids. I don't know if you've seen keloids, but they're like an exaggerated scar. And I mentioned jaundice before. So you would see a yellowish tinge to the patient and especially the whites of their eyes and then any wounds that the patient has. If this is the first time you're seeing the patient, you are the one that's finding the wounds. Um, a pertinent example of this might be, let's say you're admitting a patient who is from a nursing home. The first thing you're gonna do is examine every square inch of that patient because you wanna know if they came in with that wound or did that wound develop while the patient was here. Does that really matter for the care of the patient? No but it matters in billing. So who's gonna get the bill for that patient um, and how, how it, it factors in with how the, that patient's stay is billed. Um, so it's very important. And also to have anything for the reverse, we have it documented. So if they go to long-term care after us, we already have a wound documented or we don't have a wound documented and one develops there. So it helps to I don't want to say place blame, but it helps to identify when that wound occurred um, and sort of who owns the wound. All right. Um, inspection is largely done while interacting with the patient. Some of it will be deliberate. Some will just come out in small talk. Some patients talk more than others. Some will be more stoic and wait for you to ask them questions. Some will talk, 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 talk. And a lot of times when that happens, that means the patient's a little bit nervous. Um, my husband does that and my brother. Um, I recognize it and you'll recognize it too. Um, so if they're talking a lot, you might need to do some things to kind of calm them down um, just to let them know you're with them and they'll settle down after a few minutes. There are a lot of skin markings to look for. Um, with all that list of symptoms that I mentioned on the previous slide, you're gonna to have to describe those that you see. So if you know what it is, like say it's a tattoo, you can say there's a tattoo on the um, dorsal surface of the right hand, okay? Um, you can describe the color. You can also use other colors to describe. Right now you're not dermatologists, so you don't know what every single lesion is that's on a patient's body. I don't know that even after 30 years of being a nurse, I've seen a lot of things on people, but I don't know what everything is. And so I have to rely on my descriptive terms to describe what I see so that the next person or the physician can read my documentation and have an image in their mind what I saw and compare to what they're seeing now. All right, so you can use colors to describe brown, black, pink slash red, reddened, pinkish, like there's a lot of different ways you can describe things. Silvery, if you're looking at something like a plaque on a psoriasis, you might describe that as a silvery plaque. Um, you'll mention if the whatever you're looking at is raised or flat, that really helps a lot to describe that. Is it rough or is it smooth? And then you're gonna palpate for temperature. You use the backs of your hands. That's not to say that I've never used my palm to touch somebody. I do all the time. Um, but if you really wanna tell the difference, um, use the back of your hands. So I sometimes do touch with my palm, but then I'll switch 
to the back of my hand to assess temperature. And I might be comparing, let's say she's got a wound here on her arm and I wanna know if it's hot. I might touch it here and then touch her somewhere else. So I have something to compare to. All right. Um, I also wanna notice if my patient's skin is moist or dry. And when I say moist, I don't mean, um, I don't mean like they used their lotion today. I mean, it's not sweaty, okay? So that would be diaphoretic. So I wanna know if she's pink, warm and dry or appropriate for race, warm and dry, um, not sweaty. Sweaty is a, um, it can be a sign of just anxiety or nervousness, um, but if it's coming along with chest pain and shortness of breath, it could be a much more significant finding than just anxiety. Um, it could pertain to flakiness too. So if you notice that they're very flaky and you will see a lot of that, especially on lower legs and feet, when you take their socks off and you, the little skin flakes will go flying in the bed um, and you'll think, oh, don't breathe the skin dust in. Skin turgor, I'm gonna use. Um, there are a couple ways you can do skin turgor. You can do it on the back of the hand, but that is mostly, not mostly, partially affected by aging, okay? So if you go to your grandmother and say, Grandma, I wanna see your hand for a second, and you lift the skin on her hand, it's gonna tent for a minute, and then it'll, maybe not a minute, but it'll tent up for a little bit, and then you'll see it gradually flatten. But if you do it on yourself, it's gonna flop right back into its place. So a better place to do turgor that's less affected by aging is right up here at the chest. I can do it on myself too. Just grab a little skin and let it go and it flattens right away. So there's a couple ways you can describe turgor. You can say resilient, flattens quickly, no tenting. So those are three different ways to describe normal turgor because you can't say normal in nursing school because your teacher is gonna say, okay, what is normal? And you don't, so you wanna make sure that you're learning to describe the things that you see. When later, when you're more advanced and you're talking to other healthcare providers or you're talking to each other and study, you can say normal, but when you're being evaluated for assessment class, normal's a bad word, okay? All right, so let's say we have a wound um, and I don't have a wound on her, but if I did, I would want my tape measure because I'm gonna describe everything about that wound. The first thing is, where is the wound? And you can't just say it's on her arm. Well, is it on her right arm? Is it on her lower arm, her upper arm, the front of the arm, the back of the arm? So you need to use your medical terminology to describe where you see the arm, or where you see the wound on the arm. See, now you can laugh at me too. Hopefully this is entertaining for you. All right, so, um, where is the wound? Is it on the over the coccyx? Is it pretibial, like on the shin? Is it um, oh, let's say, is it over the left malleolus? Um, just trying to make you think of some different ways. So think about different locations and how you might describe where that wound is. You also wanna describe the type of the wound it is, if you know, um, and most of the time you'll know, unless you're getting somebody that, you've met, that can't tell you what the wound is from. And a lot of times you're still gonna know by the characteristics of the wound, but you're gonna to wanna to know if it was a burn and not just any burn, is it a chemical burn? Is it a steam burn, a thermal burn? When we get into burns, you're gonna realize how detailed it needs to be. Is it an abrasion? Is it a pressure ulcer? Is it a surgical wound? What are the dimensions of the wound? And that means how long is it? How wide is it? If you have a gaping wound, how deep is it? And you'll use a tape measure and a Q-tip for that. We have a, a day in front loading where we will, might be next semester, but we have a day where we will measure wounds. I'm pretty sure it's this semester. Um, and you'll have some that are deep and you'll have to put a Q-tip in it and measure how deep the wound is also. Is there an odor to the wound? Is there anything coming out of it that has a smell to it? Okay. 
Um, what does the peri wound skin look like? Everything around the wound, is it healthy or is it starting to look like it's being affected by whatever is caused the wound in the first place, okay? When I say, does it blanch? You can do this with yourself. Um, just take one of your fingertips, palm up, and just squeeze your fingertips. You see how the, the skin whites out? And then when you let go of it, it fills back in. When it's whited out, that's blanching. Blanching is good, okay? Um, if you have, an, let's say you have a reddened area and it doesn't blanch, maybe that area is over her coccyx and I'm, blan I'm trying to blanch it, but it doesn't blanch, that's already a stage one pressure sore beginning to happen. Um, the first stage of skin breakdown is not blanching anymore. Um, that's not to be distinguished. I want you to distinguish that from reactive hyperemia, okay? Reactive hyper hyperemia is normal. You have it right now on your bottom from sitting wherever you are. You can't see it, but if you stood up and bent over and said, do you want to check out my reactive hyperemia? One of your classmates could blanch that and it'll fill right back in. And five minutes from now, that redness will be gone. But if it doesn't blanch, that redness is here to stay until we get that patient off of that pressure area. All right, so blanchability is very important. Is there or was there a dressing already on the wound? Am I putting a new dressing on the wound? If so, what kind of dressing? Is it a dry dressing? Is it some type of alginate? We're gonna learn about all these types of dressings later. Um, but it's important to know what kind of a dressing it is. Is it just a Band-Aid? Um, is it just a piece of gauze with a loose piece of tape? Um, all that matters with re regard to wounds. All right, on this slide, I have, and I don't know if my cursor will show. Yes, it will. Okay. Um, these are different ki kinds of wound drainage that you might see. So this one on the top left here, this would be serous drainage. Okay. So that would be like, have you ever scraped yourself just a little bit and there was like a little water that kind of collected on your skin, but it didn't bleed? Or maybe it bled just a little bit, but not a lot, but it was watery blood. That's serous, okay? Maybe a tiny tinge of, it's more water than anything, okay? So try, try to picture that. If it's bleeding, it's gonna be serosanguinous. So think serous is gonna be just mostly clear fluid, okay? All right, so that's the, uh, the top left. If we move over here to the top right, this one here, this one is serosanguinous. It's not pure blood, it's blood mixed with probably serous fluid, okay? It does look bloody, but if you look down here at the bottom left, that's sanguinous. That you see blood and clotted blood, okay? So that's, that's what distinguishes the two of those. And then this one on the bottom right is purulent drainage. So that contains pus. If there's one of these that's gonna smell, it's probably gonna be the one on the bottom right, okay? It may not, or it may just have a light odor. Um, if it smells real foul, there's probably something growing in it and we need to culture it. Okay, so that was skin. I'm gonna move on to head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. This is the very abbreviated version of head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. We're not making you ENTs. Um, you're not specialists in this area, but these are the things that you can notice about the patient. And you can notice these as soon as you walk in the room. I think it would be fun to do like a, how much can you notice about your patient activity to see what all you can pick up on um, in a very short period of time. Um, but as the patient's talking to me, I can notice if their mouth is dry. Um, I may smell a breath odor and it may not matter. It may be just, I just woke up in the morning so I have morning breaths odor. It might be a fruity smell, which is like a ketone breath with diabetes. Um, there may be alcohol on their breath um, or some other type of smell. Maybe they've ingested something that they shouldn't have. So you're going to notice those things. You're also going to notice if you need to repeat yourself often because maybe the patient can't hear very well. And here's a newsflash. Just because they got hearing aids, 
doesn't mean they're working right. So um, just to keep that in mind, they may wear hearing aids, they may wear glasses, and they still might not be working right. Um, so keep noticing those things if you have to repeat yourself, or does the patient hear you better if they can see your face and see your lips moving, okay? I'm also going to notice anything about her eyes. Um, I'm not going in deep for anything here. I'm just noticing, do I see any redness? Is there anything draining from their eyes? Okay. Um, are they a mouth breather for some reason? Maybe they have a stuffed up nose. Um, maybe they're short of breath and they feel like they can get more air in through their mouth than they can their nose while they're short of breath. So just things to notice. Do they wear glasses? Do they wear hearing aids? Um, there's a thing called a hot potato voice. I think I've heard it once or twice in my career, but once you hear it, you'll recognize it forever. Um, so that would be something for you to Google, but that's usually a sore throat voice. Like you can tell that their throat hurts really bad. Um, you'll hear that after tonsillectomies. Um, and you'll also notice if there's any jaundice. All right, um, then we're gonna move to the eyes. Okay, now this abbreviation, P-E-R-R-L with A in parentheses, that is your documentation for normal. If your patient has normal pupils that are equal, round, reactive to light, and the A would be if you, te if you tested accommodation. So how you're gonna do this is I have my pen light here, and how I do it on my simulator mannequin is different than how I do it on my live patient. When I do it on a live patient, let me pull this in closer for you to see. Um, it's friendlier to the patient if you check from coming out from the side, okay? Don't shine it straight into their eye. It doesn't really hurt anything. It's just not as comfortable for the patient if you can avoid doing that. Um, now, sometimes if your pen light's getting dim, you might have to adjust yourself. But generally speaking, I want you to check the pupils coming from the outside, from the outer corner. On my human patient simulator here on Susie, her pupils will accommodate. You got to shine the light right in there and you can hear it. It'll make it like a little noise and you'll see the pupils adjust. How I want you to do it and how I want you to practice it with your partner is from the outside. That's what your, your instructor is going to be looking for. Okay, so if they, they match right and left, they're both round and they both react consensually to light, then you can say PERL, P-E-R-R-L. If you want to attest, uh, assess accommodation, you can do it with your finger or with your pen light and you just ask your patient to look at the object and then bring it in towards their nose and you'll see their pupils converge. Okay, so that's accommodation. It's not routine. Um, when I check pupils, most of the time I'm checking for if they constrict to light. Um, um, but if you're doing a more detailed neuro assessment, assessment, you might be doing accommodation. As you're looking at the roundness and of the pupils, you're going to want to look at the size. And my pen light has a pupil gauge on it, and most of them do. So you're gonna to wanna to notice what about what millimeter size your pupils are. Once in a while, you'll find somebody whose pupils don't match. That may be because there's more light on this side of, of their head than this side, but it also could be a neuro change. So just something to be to notice. So don't go home and get worried if one of your pupils is not the same size as the other, but the window's right here. It might be because the window's here and there's more light coming in that's making this one smaller than this one. Um, so just something to bear in mind. I'm gonna stop sharing. So that is everything that pertains to your skin assessment and your H-E-N-T. Um, you'll practice on your partner and practice documenting in SimChart. And I look forward to seeing you in front loading.